All right, we are on video two of our discussion on sexuality researchers and sexuality theories. So if you are starting here, you have missed something. So go back to video one. For those of you who are confident that you are in the right spot, we are picking up in our discussion of the evolutionary theory. So video one left off, we were defining evolutionary theory, talking about how they propose that the things that arouse us, the things that attract us, reflect elements that were important for reproduction and survival in earlier humanity, right? The things that I find attractive in a partner now in some way reflects my own internal survival mechanisms that if this was 3,000 years ago, this would be something that I was looking for in a partner because this is going to help me keep stay alive or this is going to help me reproduce, right? The classical example that is used of this is why the traditional attractive woman is an hourglass figure, larger breast, skinnier waist, wider hips. What this has to do with evolutionary theory is the idea that obviously, so if you have larger breasts, Breasts are fatty tissue, right? If you have breasts, you're not starving to death, okay? If you've seen pictures of uh, prisoners that released, were released from concentration camps at the end of World War II during the Holocaust, if you've seen uh, pictures or images or videos of women in Africa who are starving or who are on the verge of starving, one thing that you will notice is you do not really see large-breasted women. The reason is because it's it's fat tissue. And when you don't have enough to eat, your body begins digging into your fat reserves, right? And genetically, no matter what type of body shape you would have or how large a breast you would have on a normal situation, if you are starving to death, that fat tissue is gonna start going away. So if you were back before industrialization, before we could just run up to price cutter and get some food, if, if we were during that period of time, having breast tissue would be a sign of, okay, that woman is not starving to death, right? She is at least somewhat healthy and she has some skills for obtaining nourishment for herself. Smaller waist would be the idea that you are somewhat fit, right? She's going to be able to run from the lion. She's going to be able to go out and help us gather berries or do whatever it is that we need to do. There is an element of being fit there, of being strong there. And then wider hips. Obviously, before we had ob wings in hospitals, you kind of just laid down in the field and pushed out the babies. That, that was the only option. And obviously, wider hips make that slightly easier, right? I'm sure just because of how things are statistically, most of you know somebody or have a friend of a friend or have at least heard of a scenario where a woman had to have a c-section because her hips weren't spreading enough for her to be able to push the baby out right so the idea of again back early humanity wider hips would be an indication that you are more likely to not die in childbirth okay so you're not starving to death you have some level of fitness to be able to help us gather food and run from predators and there's a good chance you're not going to die while having my baby. So that would be the evolutionary explanation for why we have held on to this idea that for cisgendered heterosexual individuals, women, women who are found attractive are those that have this curvy body shape, this hourglass body shape. Similarly among men, right, for cisgendered heterosexual females, the reason that men who are thinner and muscular and taller are seen as attractive is because you're going to be able to help me fight off predators. You're going to be able to help me fight off wild animals. You're going to be able to drag that antelope back to camp to cook it after you've shot it with your bow and arrow or bludgeoned it with an axe or whatever it is you're going to do, right? You're going to be able to take care of this. You're going to be able to take care of me. A really interesting component of evolutionary theory is when they start getting into it to explain jealousy. So there's some older research, which the accuracy of it has been greatly debated. Um, I need to see how it is that your textbook covers this. But anyway, there's some older research that basically used to teach that you can break infidelity into two components. There's physical infidelity and there's emotional infidelity. 
Physical infidelity is when you're actually physically intimate, physically sexual with another person. Emotional infidelity is when you fall in love with another person, whether or not anything physical actual, actually happened. And there used to be this, this theory, and there was some research that supported it that is now called into question. But the idea behind it was that for women, they are going to get more upset about emotional infidelity, right? For, for heterosexual cisgender women, they're going to get more upset about emotional than physical infidelity. Meaning, they would, if, if I was enacting this, this theory or this research, what I would be saying is, it would be a lot easier for me to find out that you had a hookup, a fling, a one night stand, whatever, than to find out that you actually fell in love with somebody somebody else, even if you never acted on it, right? I'd rather you sleep with somebody else than be in love with somebody else. And the idea is that for cisgendered heterosexual men, that that was flip-flopped, that it would be much easier for them to accept that a partner had romantic feelings for somebody else than that a partner had, had actually been physically, sexually intimate with somebody else, right? You feel however you want about this other dude, just don't go have sex with him. So this was, and again, the, the accuracy of this research is very much debated. Some people claim it's very sexist, but it, it, it was out there. So what evolutionary theorists did with this is they said, well, if you think about it, that makes perfect sense with evolutionary history, right? Because if I'm a female back thousands of years ago, and I'm relying on the male that I'm with, that I've born children with, to provide for me, okay, if he's out having sex with somebody else, that doesn't really affect me all that much. But if he decides that he's in love with somebody else and he's not going to take care of me and my kids anymore, I really might be in trouble here because who is going to help protect me? Vice versa for the men, right? The idea proposed by evolutionary theorists was it makes sense that there's more physical jealousy because they didn't want to be wasting resources taking care of children that weren't theirs. So if they found out that a partner had actually been having sex with other people, how do I know I'm not wasting my time and energy feeding kids that aren't even mine, right? Sure, so what? You notice this other guy and you like him, okay. I want to make sure that, that, that there's a chance that a couple of these kids running around don't actually belong to him or else what am I doing here? So it's the idea of ensuring your lineage, ensuring your parenting and your, your parenthood, your fatherhood, and that you're actually providing for your own. So that's how evolutionary theorists explained this research. Okay. And the next three I did group for the purposes of this class, it's, it's easy to consider them together. The sociological, feminist, and queer perspectives. The reason that all three of these overlap is they all focus on the ways that society influences our sexual behaviors and our sexual ideas. So the sociological theory really focuses on elements of family and religion and culture and all that. The feminist theory takes it a step further and says, yes, however, most of these influences are coming from the perspective of a middle-class male viewpoint, middle-class male viewpoint from the majority perspective. So white middle-class male viewpoint. And the idea that a lot of the, the feminist perspective on sexuality goes towards is we need examples of more lived experiences of women. And that a lot of the sexual oppression that women feel is initiated by the male ideas in our culture, the patriarchal ideas in our culture. The queer theory takes that a step further and says a lot of this has also come from a very heterosexual standpoint that we've always personified a couple as being a male and female and most of our sexuality research has come from this. And they would also argue that we maybe need to, to tone it down a little bit with the labels. We don't need to label every person as heterosexual or same-sex attracted. Um, I hesitate using the word homosexual simply because there are some movements now who are proposing that that's an offensive term. I've had students in the past agree with it. I've had students in the past disagree with it. And so I don't, I don't want to inadvertently use a term that would be offensive to anybody. Um, but the, the queer theory proposes that we need to just stop assigning labels of male, female, heterosexual, homosexual to everything. We need to recognize all the continuums that can exist in sexuality. 
So now we're going to transition just a little bit and we're going to talk about some of the important researchers. Your textbook gave you a whole bunch of these and there are a lot that are important. These are some of the most interesting ones in my opinion and these are the ones that I always enjoyed lecturing about whenever whenever we did this class in person. So just a quick recap of some of my favorite historical sexuality researchers. Evelyn Hooker. Evelyn Hooker challenge so a little bit of a backdrop in case you missed this in your textbook up until the 80s same-sex attraction was actually listed as a mental disorder in the dsm which is basically the the psychology bible it's this big diagnostic manual for how we diagnose disorders it includes a criteria for diagnosing depression anxiety everything you can imagine and homosexuality was in there as a diagnosable mental disorder and the argument for that is that they believed if you are a homosexual, then you also have all these other psychological problems going on that are leading to this. And so we should be considering this a disorder. And so Evelyn Hooker challenged this and basically said, all right, so you're saying that if the reason it's a disorder is because there's automatically other psychological problems, then based on giving some psychological diagnostic tests, you should be able to tell who's gay and who's straight, right? And so she got this whole committee of psychologists to agree to this. And she said, all right, you pick whatever tests you want to give. Depression inventories, anxiety inventories, behavior inventories. You pick any test that you want to give this group of people. The only thing you cannot ask about is their sexual orientation, their sexual behavior with, with same-sex partners. That's the only thing that's off limits. Anything else, give them whatever you want. She goes, at the end, and I can't remember the number of participants, but she goes, at the end, I want you to tell me which of the ones in this group were heterosexual and which of the ones in this group are gay. If you are saying that you can predict it based on their psychological profile. And they all failed. Like none of the professionally trained doctorate level psychologists and researchers were able to differentiate who was gay and who was and who was heterosexual based on these inventories based on these psychological tests and her study that that thing that she did with them is considered one of the groundbreaking things that actually got sexual orientation removed as a diagnosable mental disorder psychological disorder from the dsm kinsey Kinsey basically decided he wanted to know what is everyone doing when it comes to sex. His famous studies were called sexual behavior in the human male and sexual behavior in the human female. There's been movies about him. There's been series about him. It was in the 50s. It was super controversial. He traveled around the country and interviewed thousands of people about their sexual behavior and the sexual preferences. Kinsey was the first one to formally propose that we need to view sexual orientation on a spectrum and not just heterosexual homosexual like he was the first one to propose no there there's a scale here and people can fall somewhere in between and that that is the lived experience of some people they never fully identify on one or the other that it's a spectrum and then masters and johnson masters and johnson were biological physiological researchers and they were known for come have sex in our lab we'll watch you they would actually sit and like take notes while they observed people having sex. Um, they received a lot of pushback, mainly for the, the accusation. Let me see how much time I have left. Okay, okay. Mainly for the accusation of you can't say this is generalizable because people who volunteer to come have sex in your lab while you are watching are not representative of the average person in the United States. To which their argument was, you are probably right but it doesn't matter because biology is biology and the climactic orgasmic response of a prostitute is the same as the climactic orgasmic response of a secretary housewife there's it's it's biology it's physiology it doesn't matter so that was their big argument and that leads into the final discussion of when we are doing sexuality research one of the big problems is with sampling and generalizability with volunteer bias. Are the people who are volunteering for your study representative of the overall sample or, or are they in some way different because they're volunteering for a sexuality study? I'll pause this and pick back up because I'm running out of time.